And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here, and today we're going to check out a game that I've been looking forward to for quite a while, or at least looking forward to the release of in the United States for quite a while. That game is Rialto, which of course is a Steffen Feld game, uh, my favorite designer, uh, and one which is being brought to us now by Tasty Minstrel Games. I'll be hitting stores here shortly. Uh, the game focuses around getting control of various different areas using a drafting of cards. Now you don't draft these cards one at a time, you draft an entire pile, and then decide what you're going to keep from those piles. Pile, that pile, as well as other ones that you can potentially draw, uh, and you know, you're just going to kind of narrow it down to what you want to keep, and then play those cards over the next phases of the game. Uh, so real quick, we'll take a look at what you get inside this box and how the game plays, and then we'll come back here and we'll get my final opinions on Rialto. So here you can see the components for Rialto, and I've got it set up for a two-player game. The changes between the two and the five-player game are very, very minor. Uh, there is a special two-player variant, I'm not showing that here, uh, which includes a dummy third player, but note that the rules really won't be different for any number of players uh, from two to five. Now what we're looking at here is a board, uh, and this board is divided into six different districts for the six rounds of the game. Each round of the game will be played in a specific district, and um, the districts are numbered one through six uh, with these tiles that are placed randomly, so that the order will change each game. In addition, you'll see we have an area over here with a lot of buildings. There are 12 different buildings of level 1 through 4 in three different colors, green, yellow, and blue. And green, yellow, and blue will correspond to different phases of each round uh, in which you can use those buildings. Each player has some tokens here at the bottom, uh, and there's an area to hold the coins, and then we have some bonus tiles out on the board here. And these bonus tiles are going to go to the player who first manages to get one of his councilmen in each of the three light-colored districts. So each of these three bluish districts here, the first person to get a councilman in each of those areas will get five bonus points. And the same is true for the three of these orangish areas, uh, which will flip this tile over, and that player will score five points. Each player on the board has two tokens, one on the doge track here, which is going to determine turn order and also break ties, uh, and then one over here on the scoring track, which is perhaps one of the hardest to read scoring tracks I've ever seen, in which the numbers are positioned between these two lights, not on the lights. So when you have three points, for example, you're between these, three, uh, these two lights here at the position where the moon is. It just makes it very hard to count, one of my least favorite things about this game. Finally, we have some bridges here with points on them, and we have some gondolas here with points on them, and I'll cover those shortly. Now, each player has their own player board, and on that player board, they're actually going to start with five of their councilmen in their own personal supply, as well as some amount of money. The first player, in most cases, will start with one money, and players after them will start with more money than that. The first phase of each game is going to be, or each round, is going to be dealing out these cards. And the way this works is that you deal out six cards from this stack into different piles, and there's always going to be one more pile than there is the number of players. So in the case of a two-player game, there would be three piles. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We could deal those out like that. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have three piles of six cards each. Now the way they suggest you deal this is you deal one card to each pile, and then again one card to each pile, but for the, the show here, it doesn't really matter. In this deck of cards, there are different types of cards. We have doge cards, and money cards, bridge cards, gondola cards, councilman cards, uh, and there are also wild cards and building cards. So if we look through this other pile here, you'll see that we have a building card there, uh, and we have a wild card here. So in turn order, which is determined by this doge track for this part of the turn only, you get to choose one of these three piles of cards. Now you'll note there's always one extra pile of cards left over. So maybe I decide that I like this pile of cards best, and the next person in turn order decides they like this card, pile of cards best. All right, at this point we each have our piles of cards, uh, and in addition to those you're going to draw two extra cards to add to your hand. So each player is going to get two extra cards. Now let's say this is my pile of cards. In the next phase, we're going to be using these cards to play out actions, essentially. And the more cards you have, the better the action is essentially going to be. So we look and we see I have two doges, uh, and I have a coin, and I have a bridge, a councilman, a gondola, a building, and a joker. Now, from these eight cards that I have, I can only keep seven. So I have to decide which one I want to get rid of. Maybe I don't think that the gondola is very important right now when I place this face down in my discard pile. Each player keeping their own discard pile so that you don't know what's been discarded. After everyone has done that, you're going to move on to the next phase, which is phase two. Now, before we do that, there are buildings that you can use in each of these phases, and the, the green buildings apply to the first phase, which is choosing your cards and keeping your cards. You'll get these during the building part of the second phase of each round, but right now let's cover these. We'll see that 
Each of these buildings has a value on it. This one's worth one point, and it also costs one building card to get. And we'll see here that it says one slash three. This basically means that you can either take one card from the remaining pile of cards after everyone's chosen their cards, or you can draw three extra cards uh, at the end of your turn in order to add your hand, but you still only get to keep seven. Now if you look at the next one, it's two points, also a green building. Uh, it says that you can keep one extra card. That's it. You get to keep one extra card, so instead of discarding down to seven, you would keep eight cards. And then the next ones just get better. This one is, you know, either draw one from the leftover pile or draw three extras and add them to your hand and keep an extra one. And the next one lets you keep an extra two. Now, in order to get those, or in order to use those, I should say, you have to place a gold coin from your supply onto the building that you've built in your own area. So if I had this here and I had the gold coin, I would be able to place that there in, or in order to draw an extra card from this leftover pile or the three cards from the deck and add them to my hand before I discard down. That's how buildings are going to work. When we move on to phase two, we're going to be using our cards. And again, starting in turn order here, we'll start with the doge. Uh, whoever's highest on the doge track and from top down at that point on is going to play cards from their hand in order to take the doge action. So, for example, I have a choice. I could either play two doge cards or I could use my wild card and play three doge cards. If I play two, let's say for example, the next person has a chance to play and maybe they play one and the next person plays, you know, well there's only two people, so I play two and my opponent plays one. At that point, I would get to move forward two spaces on the doge track, but since I played the most cards, I actually get a bonus and I get to move forward an extra space on the track. The other player who played one would move forward once and then these cards would be placed into my own discard pile. After that, we move on to money and I'm going to look at my money cards and see, okay, how much money do I need? I could either take one or I could take two with my wild card. So maybe I decide to play one and my opponent decides to play two. At that point, I would get one money and they would actually get three because they get the two plus the bonus. In addition to this, they're going to now go first for playing of cards in the next round. So the doge does not always determine who goes first. The, the actual bonus awarded determine who goes first in the next playing of cards, which in this case is buildings. So we'll see, I only have one building, but maybe I want to get a two building. So my opponent plays maybe two building cards, and I play two building cards. Well, since I'm ahead on the doge track, I actually win in this case, and my two building cards count as three building cards. That allows me to take any one of the three value buildings that are out on here, here on the board. And I already showed you what the green ones do. The yellow ones are slightly different. The one value yellow one actually lets you pass on playing and come back and play later. And you also get to keep your coin, or you get a coin back when you use it. So you get to see what everybody else plays before you decide to play your cards. The next one allows you to use one card as a different card. So for example, if you don't have a coin, you could place a coin on this building. Well, I guess you, you don't have a coin card. You could place a coin from your supply onto this building to use another card as a coin card or any other card for that matter. The third one is going to let you have a wild and you just have to pay a coin in order to get that extra wild. Uh, so it counts as an extra wild card. And the fourth one is going to let you use one card as two cards of another type by paying a coin each building requiring a coin to activate and can only be used once per round. You'll note that your player board only has seven spots, so you can only have seven buildings, and if you lose a building or if you want to build over a building, you get to keep the points for that building, and then you just place the new building where that building was. The blue buildings uh, we're not going to cover yet because they're used in the last part of the round, uh, but these buildings right here that you see here are used during card play, so right now we're playing cards you could take those buildings and use them during this phase. The next portion after buildings is going to be playing bridge cards. And bridge cards are where you start to earn points. So we'll see I have one bridge and I have one of the councilman cards left. Uh, so now we go on to bridges and since I won the previous round I would play my bridge cards if I wanted to. You can always hold on to your cards for the next round in order to try and get a bigger play in the next round if you want. But we'll say I play my one bridge card and let's say my opponent also plays one. What this does, it gets me one point per bridge card that I play. Uh, if I played more bridge cards than anyone else, I would get an extra point. But in addition to that, I get to place the next bridge. And we'll see that we have these bridge tiles out on the board. On them, they show two different values. For example, this one is a five and a three. And these bridges go on the board between the districts that you can see. And I can choose to place this as the winner onto any of the places on the board. Uh, so we'll see, maybe I don't like placing it on District 1, which is currently active, I could place it over here. And so this district at the end of the game is worth 5 points, this one over here is worth 3. And that's how the bridges are going to work. If you don't play any bridge cards on your turn, you're actually going to lose a point, uh, and that will, of course, be detrimental to your endgame scoring. 
The next phase is the gondola phase, and I have no gondola card. So let's say my opponent wins that, and he gets to place out this gondola here. Each gondola has a one point value on each side, as opposed to the bridges, which actually change points throughout the game. This one is a six and a three. So throughout the game, those will change. The gondolas will always stay the same. And when you place this gondola, you can place it between two districts, and then you can choose a district on which to place one of your guys. So for example, let's say I place it here between one and three, and then I move one of my guys, which would actually be yellow in this case, to either one of those two districts. Maybe I want to place them in San Marco. After the bridge phase comes the gondola phase, in which you're going to play gondola cards from your hand in order to take the gondola action. Now, I personally don't have any gondola cards in my hand, but maybe my opponent plays one gondola. Uh, now what that's going to do is it's going to allow him to get one of his people from the board, his general supply, back to his own player board. And in addition, whoever gets the most is going to place out the next bridge, or sorry, gondola tile. And the gondola tiles have one point value on each side, as opposed to the bridges, which actually vary throughout the game. So this one has six and three, but the next one has four and three, and so forth and so on. They change and they're randomized at the start of the game. When you get this tile, you can place it between any two districts. So, for example, I could place it here and here, or maybe I think that it's a good spot to be between one and three because one is currently active. Uh, you'll have to pay attention to where you place these because eventually each area will run out of areas to place bridges or gondolas, and then that area will essentially be closed for the rest of the game, uh, and whatever pieces are there will be used for scoring at the end. But if I place this here, I have a one and a one on each side. But in addition, the yellow player who's taking this action gets to go ahead and place one of their councilmen on either of those two areas. So if they want to place it on one, they can, but maybe they want to place it on three to plan for the future and, you know, try and get some type of majority there. Anyhow, after that phase, you move on to the councilman phase. On the councilman phase is going to be these blue cards here. When you play these, you're going to play them to the table, and maybe I play one and my opponent plays one. Uh, we tie, but I have the tiebreaker on the doge. I'm going to move one of my councilmen from the supply uh, my general or my my supply of my own pieces into the currently active area, uh, and if I was the bonus person, I would actually move an extra one onto that area. In addition, uh, you're going to be trying to, of course, get your guys into the three different districts to get the five bonus points. So I'm one third of the way there, but so is yellow because they got to place somebody with a gondola. On um, you're trying to, of course, get majority in each district while spreading yourself amongst the district to get the bonus points. Of course, I showed you the jokers earlier, and managing those is going to be important to getting the bonuses that you can get by having the most cards. Uh, and jokers can also be used as two jokers together to be one of any type of card. Um, so there's always that, but it's, it's still uh, kind of a bad move to use two jokers if you don't need to. The third part of each, of each round, so we've gone through one, which is getting your cards uh, and using green buildings, two, which is playing your cards and using yellow buildings. The third part is simply activating the blue buildings. And of course, you need money to do this again. So getting money is going to be important for getting the extra actions given to you by the buildings. Uh, the blue building of one value will allow you to upgrade any building you have to the next higher value of building for one coin. So, for example, if I wanted to play one coin on this, I could upgrade this one building to the two blue building for essentially free, not having to play the building cards. The next building in blue is going to be worth two points. Uh, and you'll see here that it gives you one point, and it also lets you get one of your councilmen from the general supply into your personal supply. But again, costs a coin. The third one is kind of powerful, and it'll be more powerful in more player games. What this does is it allows you to move up the doge track based on your position on the doge track. So if you're in the third position in a three-player game, you would get to move up three spaces by placing a coin onto this, and it will kind of help you catch up on the doge track in order to get into a better position. And the last blue building is simply worth three points by placing a coin onto it. At the end of each round, you're going to take all of the coins off of your activated buildings and return them to the supply. You're going to go ahead and start the next round. You're going to move this to the second district, which of course in this, this part is up here. Uh, you're going to deal out new decks of cards. You're going to go ahead and select those cards again in order of the doge track. Use all of your green buildings, then your yellow buildings and your card playing. And again, back to the blue buildings. Uh, the game will end after six rounds. And what you're going to score after that is you're going to score, one, all of the point values of all of your buildings that you've built in your own area. Two, you're going to look and see who has the majority in each of these districts and how many points that district is worth based on the gondolas and the bridges that have been built between all of the different districts. So whoever has the majority is going to get all of the points, whoever has second place gets half of the points rounded down, and whoever gets third has half of the points rounded down from that. So you're going to see the, you know, the worse off you are in each district, the less points you're going to get. So having control of those is very important. 
In addition to that, you're going to get a few bonus points for having leftover pieces on your board, two points for each, uh, well, one point for each two leftover pieces on your board, and whoever best manages to get the right cards, play those cards in the most beneficial way to getting control over this board, and build the best buildings and best utilize those buildings will be the winner. Well, there you have it. That is Rialto, a Feld game for anywhere between two and five players that isn't going to have many gameplay changes dependent on the number of players you have. Uh, it's a little bit lighter than most of the Feld games that I tend to prefer uh, over others. So my favorites are, of course, Trajan and Bora Bora. Uh, I didn't really like Macau. Uh, the uh, Spiker Stot is okay. Uh, it's a nice, lighter Feld experience, but it's just not quite the meaty depth I'm looking for. Now, with this one, uh, I actually think I enjoy it quite a bit, even though it's lighter. Uh, and it's because of the differences from the traditional Feld style uh, that I like it. Uh, the drafting of cards is, is a unique aspect, in, in my opinion. Uh, you have these three different piles of cards, and it's up to you to determine what of those three piles is going to be best for the current round. But you're not limited to only those. You can choose through your selection of buildings that you get from the cards, uh, in, you know, what cards to keep, what cards to get rid of, uh, you know, just using which buildings are important and how you think those are going to interact with the gameplay uh, is going to drastically change how things play out. Um, as I said, it's a very easy game uh, to learn because there's so few things going on. You simply get your cards and you choose how to play them. But the fact that you can choose not to play them, carry cards over from round to round, try and accumulate a specific type of card uh, and carry out that action stronger than everybody else is going to, you know, give you some strategic options as to how to play. So all in all, I think Rialto is a very good example of a lighter Feld title. Uh, not super light, but kind of in the medium light category that I think can be a good introduction to people who you'd like to bring further into heavier Feld games, or just for people who prefer the medium light aspect of gaming. So with all that said, I definitely suggest checking out Rialto from TMG once it hits stores here in the United States. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.